Welcome to Liberation Talks, the aftermath of World War II from 1945 to 1946. Thank you for joining us here in today's activity, either via Zoom or Facebook Live. This event is part of our Liberation War and Hope program, a series of events held in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, presented by the Ayala Foundation through the Filipinas Heritage Library, the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines, and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Let us begin our program by singing the Philippine National Anthem to be followed by the U.S. National Anthem. Tumayo po tayong lahat, ilagay ang kanang kamay sa ating dibdib at sabay-sabay nating awitin ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Bayang magiliw, presa silang alan, alam ng puso sa hindi mo'y buhay. Lupang hinirang, tuyang ka ng mag-iting, sa manlulupi, di ka pasisigil, sa dagat at bundok, sa simoy at sa langit mong bughaw. May hirap ang ulat, awit sa paglayang minamahal, ang kisat ng wataw at mo'y tagumpay na nagbiningning. Ang bituin at araw niya kailan pa may di magdidiling Lupa ng araw ng walhat ipagsinta Buhay langit sa piling mo Aming lingaya na pag may mga api Ang mamatay ng dahil sa'yo Once again to our viewers in the Philippines and good evening in the United States. I am Sofia Santiago, the Associate Manager and Curator of the Filipinas Heritage Library and I am your host for today's event. I will be joined later by Ms. Desiree Benipayo who will be our moderator for the Q&A session. Ms. Desiree, with an intense interest in World War II history, founded the Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation with her husband. It aims to educate the Filipino people on our World War II history via multimedia platforms like film and books. She is also the secretary of Memorare Manila 1945. Recently, her book Honor, which was also made into a film, won 2019 Best Nonfiction Book at the 38th National Book Awards. Liberation Talks, the aftermath of World War II from 1945 to 1946, is presented by Filipinas Heritage Library or FHL, a Filipiniana library managed by Ayala, Founda Ayala Foundation, and its mission is to spark and stoke interest 
in the visual, oral, and printed story of the Filipino through its collections of documentary heritage materials in the form of books, periodicals, documents, photographs, music, videos, and digital resources. FHL has been organizing programs related to World War II, such as exhibitions, lectures, and film screenings in connection with the library's Roderick Paul collection of books and materials on World War II in the Philippines. These materials were entrusted to FHL by Mr. Roderick Hall, a World War II survivor who has been generously supporting the library's World War II collection and programs. This is also one of the reasons we are inspired to raise awareness about the struggles and contributions of our people during the war. As mentioned earlier, this event is part of our Liberation War and Hope program, a series of events held in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, presented by the Filipinas Heritage Library and the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines. Let us now hear the welcome remarks of Ayala Foundation President, Mr. Roel Maranan, to be followed by messages from our partners, the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines, represented by Jepu Deputy Chief of Mission, John Law, and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, represented by its chairman, Dr. Rene Escalante. Isang mapagpala at magiting na umaga sa ating lahat. Ayala Foundation, through the Filipinas Heritage Library, is honored to host the Liberation, War and Hope program, which commemorates the 75th anniversary of the end of Second World War. As part of this program, we are kicking off Liberation Talks, a lecture series supported by the United States Embassy in the Philippines and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Along with FHL's mandate to preserve the digital, oral, and written histories, it has the responsibility to interpret, educate, and make these materials and resources available to a larger audience. With the Roderick Hall collection of World War II resources as one of the core collections of FHL, we are continually inspired to raise awareness about the struggles, experiences, and contributions of our people during the war. It is our privilege to be joined by a panel of eminent resource speakers. Dr. Rico Jose of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, Ms. Cecilia Garlan of Bataan Legacy Historical Society, Rampage author, James Scott, and Field War Foundation's Des Benipayo. In today's webinar, we hope to shed light on the story of the Philippines right after its destruction from the war and ask three main questions. How was the Philippines able to rise up and rehabilitate itself from the state of war? How did the Filipinos and Americans help each other with the shared experience of winning and losing the war? What are the lessons we can learn from the aftermath of the war that we can replicate and apply to the experiences we are facing today in this health crisis? We at the Ayala Foundation and the Filipinas Heritage Library hope that these questions will allow us to have important conversations which may lead to a careful re-examination of our place and contribution in this country while reflecting on the parallelisms, answers, and questions we will be asking ourselves after today's program. Allow me to thank our partners for today's event the United States Embassy in the Philippines, and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. We are grateful in your commitment in sharing the lessons of history with as many Filipinos as possible. Again, we thank all of our webinar participants and viewers for being here with us today.
We hope you will continue to support our efforts in telling the story of these historical events that reflect the various facets of our shared humanity. As we learn more about the extraordinary lives led by ordinary people during difficult times, may we be inspired to become heroes in our own ways. Maging magiting sa isip, sa salita, at sa gawa. Muli, maraming salamat and welcome to the Liberation Talks. Good morning. It's a tremendous honor to speak with you today alongside National Historical Commission of the Philippines Chairman Rene Escalante, Ayala Foundation President Noel Maranan, UP History Professor Dr. Ricardo Jose, Founder and Executive Director of the Bataan Legacy Historical Society, Cecilia Gerlan, Founder of the Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation, Desiree Benepayo, and former Harvard, Harvard Neiman Fellow and author of Rampage, James Scott. I'd also like to acknowledge the Filipinas Heritage Library team, led by Ms. Suzanne Yupanko. Your work and dedication have enabled us to transition to virtual programming during this time and continue commemorations of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the Philippines. Today, as we grapple with the ongoing pandemic, it's more important than ever to draw strength, courage, and hope from the historical events we commemorate today. During World War II, Filipinos and Americans banded together. They confronted seemingly impossible odds. But these World War II heroes fought side by side, enduring and overcoming one challenge after another. Slowly, they cobbled together small successes, which led to bigger successes and ultimately paved the way to liberation and victory. Winning the war was not the end. It was just the beginning of a new set of challenges. The Philippines and so much of the world suffered terrible losses and devastation. And the task of rebuilding for the future was a daunting one, but together our countries emerged stronger than before. The outstanding group of historians joining us today will discuss the war and rebuilding of the Philippines. They will share extraordinary stories of resilience, perseverance, and cooperation. You will hear about the amazing Filipino and American soldiers, civilians, and government leaders who as allies for freedom emerged from the ashes of war and built the deep and enduring relationship our countries enjoy to this day. As we listen to this discussion, I would encourage all of us to reflect on the challenges we overcame 75 years ago and consider how we can apply those lessons learned from that history to the challenges we face today. Countries around the world are coming together to confront a global threat to our health, our economies, and our societies. But I'm certain we can and will prevail, and we'll need to do so together. Reflecting on our shared history and sacrifice at events like this deepens my faith in the continued promise of the U.S.-Philippine relationship. It instills me with confidence we will emerge from today's challenges stronger than before, just like our nations did 75 years ago today. On behalf of the United States Embassy, thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the program. Good morning, everyone. As the government agency mandated to promote Philippine history, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines would like to express its gratitude to the Ayala Foundation, Filipinas Heritage Library, and the Embassy of the United States of America for staging this important event. In addition, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Ricardo Jose for his valuable contribution to the NHCP sponsored events and lectures to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. After 75 years since the end of the Second World War, let me invite all of you to reflect on the nature and rationale of our commemorative activities. Why are we remembering this dark and painful chapter in our history? Why are we conducting conferences and lectures about the Second World War? The first reason that comes to my mind is we want to honor and pay tribute to our war heroes. 
Let us take this opportunity to memorialize our veterans and promote their ideals and patriotic deeds. Let us also remember the valor of the Filipino spirit that was shown in Bataan and the courage and ferocity of the guerrillas who fought during the liberation period. Second, I think we conduct lectures and webinars because we want to extract valuable lessons from our experience of the Second World War. For me, the greatest lesson we can learn from this event is the realization that nobody wins in a war. The victors only claim ruins, destruction, and hate. All the bitter pains it caused us is a reminder that victory can never ever justify the death of thousands of innocent civilians and the destruction of valuable properties. So as we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the end of this bloody and destructive war, let us join forces in preventing war and preserving peace. For the past five months, we are again in the midst of another world war. But this war is so different from the two world wars that happened in the 20th century. This is a war without guns and bullets, without human soldiers, without borders, and without ceasefire agreements. Our enemy in this war is without mercy. It is indiscriminate. It does not respect children, women, and old people. Our enemy is not interested in spoils of war. It has no intention of regime change. It is not concerned about the rich mineral resources underneath the earth. It's not even interested in religious, ethnic, or ideological hegemony. Its goal has nothing to do with racial superiority. Its only agenda is to kill people and wreak havoc on our economy. Like what we did during the occupation years, there is a new call for all of us to stand united and help our new guerrillas. Let us support our medical practitioners, the men in uniform, our national and local officials, and other men and women who are waging war against COVID-19 virus. Let us also contribute in our modest way and in whatever form just to prevent the virus from claiming more casualties. For us who are not frontliners, let us follow the medical protocols issued by our health officials. I just hope that the speakers in this conference will give us more insights about the Second World War that are useful in our current battle against the pandemic we are fighting today. Again, thank you and let us all stay safe and healthy. Thank you to Ayala Foundation President Mr. Roel Maranan, Deputy Chief of Mission John Law of U.S. Embassy in the Philippines, and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines Chairman, Dr. Rene Escalante, for those insightful messages. Before we proceed, here are a few reminders. First, in case there are lags in the video or live stream, please stay on the session and just wait for it to load again. Second, all attendees on Zoom are on mute to assure the quality of our audio during this webinar. Third, please note that some of the images in the presentation are graphic in nature and may be disturbing to some viewers. If you have questions, you may use the Q&A box for our Zoom attendees or the comment section in our Facebook live stream and we'll try our best to accommodate them during our Q&A session later. Here is our lineup of talks for today. To talk about the background of pre-war Manila and the battle, we have Mr. James Scott. It will be followed by a talk delivered by Dr. Ricardo Jose on the, on the rehabilitation and relief. Lastly, Ms. Cecilia Gerlan will be talking about justice in the situation of the veterans. These talks will be followed by a Q&A session to be moderated by Ms. Des Benifayo. Now, let me introduce to you for joining us from South Carolina, USA, Mr. James Scott. 
Mr. James Scott is a former Neiman Fellow at Harvard and is the author of Rampage, which was named one of the best books of 2018 by the editors at Amazon, Kirkus, and Military Times. And it was also chosen as a finalist for the prestigious Gilder Lerman Prize for Military History by the New York Historical Society. His other works include Target, Tokyo, a 2016 Pulitzer Prize finalist, The War Below, and The Attack on the Liberty, which won the Rear Admiral Samuel Elliott Morrison Award. James Scott lives with his wife and two children in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Today, he'll be talking about pre-war Manila and the battle. Now, I give the floor to Sir James Scott. Hi, Sir James. Hey, how are you? Good morning, everybody, and thank you for tuning in uh, early this Saturday morning for a uh, what promises to be, I think, a, a, an exciting historical uh, series of presentations. Before I begin, I would like to also say thank you to the Ayala Foundation, the Filipinas Heritage Library, the U.S. Embassy, and the National Historical Commission in the Philippines for sponsoring today's events and making this program a, a possibility. I'd also like to thank the huge team at the Filipinas Heritage Library who's worked tirelessly for the last two months putting together this webinar, compiling the images, and making um, all the visuals you see uh, come together the way they have. And lastly, I'd like to say a, what an honor and a privilege it is um, to be able to join, even if it is by Zoom and not in person, with Dr. Rico Jose, Cecilia Galeron, and of course, Des Benapayo, all dear friends and colleagues and some of the really the brightest minds when it comes to World War II research. So uh, it's a great, it's great, great opportunity to get together with them. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, before we get into the aftermath of World War II, I'm going to give us the, the context of pre-war Manila and the Battle of Manila. So to truly appreciate the tragedy of the Battle of Manila, it's important to rewind to the turn of the 20th century, soon after the United States had captured the Philippines during the Spanish-American War. Now, the United States had hired famed municipal planner and urban architect Daniel Burnham to come over to the Philippines and to help plan a modern city, one that reflected the image of the United States. In the four decades leading up to World War II, Manila developed into a small slice of America, home not only to thousands of U.S. service members, but employees of companies like General Electric, Del Monte, and B.F. Goodrich, many of whom liked to pop into Hecox's department store and shop for the latest imported fashions. Others, meanwhile, often went, wandered down the Escolta, dubbed the Fifth Avenue of Manila. Often called the Pearl of the Orient, the city boasted a great quality of life, with social clubs and movie theaters, golf courses, and swimming pools. The New York Times said it best when describing the capital in 1932. Quote, Manila is by far the most beautiful of all cities in the Orient. From the top of the University Club, it seems half hidden in a canopy of trees, green everywhere, a city within a park. It boasted a rich history, stretching back more than four centuries, and a wonderful mix of cultures, Filipino, Spanish, Chinese, and American. Stately buildings populated the city, like the Philippines General Hospital, pictured here, designed in the California mission-style architecture you can find today in the United States. Here's another shot we have here of the hospital's internal courtyard. Few buildings, however, could rival the luxurious Manila Hotel, which opened its doors in 1911, built in a very similar style to PGH, the only difference being that the Manila Hotel sported green roof tiles instead of red. To live in Manila in 1941, remembered CBS News correspondent Bill Dunn, was to experience the good life. But that good life ended on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and invaded the Philippines. Here, Cavite Naval Base burns. American and Filipino forces fell back to Bataan and Corregidor to fight a desperate battle to hold off the advancing Japanese. But that effort ultimately was doomed, leading to the notorious Bataan Death March 
followed by years of suffering in horrific prisoner of war camps. Manila suffered greatly during the three years of the enemy's occupation. Japanese officers seized homes and cars from residents. Others looted food supplies and department stores, stole farm equipment, and left fields to rot. Store shelves sat empty, and basic supplies like medicines vanished. Felipe Buen Camino, writing in his diary, captured the frustration of many. Quote, what kind of an army is this that fights a war with pianos and nice residences? As the years passed, Manila's economy collapsed and the social fabric began to unravel. Families unable to care for children went so far as to abandon them to orphanages or even sell them. Starvation, meanwhile, ran rampant, claiming as many as 500 souls a day. An army of beggars soon flooded the streets. Marcial Chauco, a Manila attorney whose diary captured the horror many endured, described it best in December 1944. Quote, today we are living under conditions in which only the fittest among us can hope to survive. Those American families who were caught when the war broke out in the Philippines and were locked up in the internment camp at Santo Tomas suffered equally as the daily caloric intake plummeted and starvation took hold. A medical survey conducted in January 1945 revealed that the average male internee had lost 51 pounds, the average female 32. To survive those desperate Americans, eight dogs, cats, pigeons, and even rats, which sold for about eight pesos each on a camp's black market. Throughout the city, others resorted to thievery, including the plundering of graves in search of jewelry, dentures, eyeglasses, even clothing, anything that could be bartered or sold to buy a fistful of rice. Carmen Guerrero Knockpill said it best when she wrote, quote, we survived by means of savage and ardent cunning. We became a race of spies, thieves, saboteurs, informers, and looters, callous and miserly. The promise of an end to that long national nightmare finally came on January 5th, 1945, when MacArthur's forces landed at Lingayan Gulf. Three weeks later, on February 3rd, that evening around 6.30, the American cavalry rolled into Manila. Excitement over America's arrival proved short-lived. The same day Americans reached Manila, Admiral Sanji Iwabuchi, the Japanese admiral in the city at the time, gave the order to begin the planned destruction of the Pearl of the Orient. Incendiary squads swept through the districts north of the Pasig River and set fires in dynamited buildings. Manila residents grabbed what belongings they could carry and fled. General Robert Baitler, commander of the 37th Infantry, described it best in his report. We were powerless to stop it. We had no way of knowing in which of the thousands of places the demolitions were being controlled, he wrote. Big modern reinforced concrete and steel office buildings were literally blown from their foundations to settle crazily in twisted heaps. MacArthur's pilot, Douglas Rhodes, witnessed the scene from the air. Quote, the spectacle was an appalling sight. The entire downtown section of the city was a mass of flames, he wrote in his diary. Flames rising 200 feet in the air. In addition, the Japanese blew all the bridges over the river which divided the city. After destroying Manila's northern districts, the Japanese fell back across the river into central Manila forcing American troops to cross the Pasig and begin what would prove to be an incredibly bloody urban fight. To make it harder on advancing Americans, the Japanese barricaded more than 50 intersections in Manila, like this one at the corner of Dart and Oregon streets, where they sunk railroad axles upright in the street plant and planted landmines, all of which was then covered by a 50 caliber machine gun. This is a photograph you can see here of another such intersection, and you can see they've taken two truck bodies and cabled them together and anchored them on a tree there on the side. And then again, you can see poles sunk upright in the uh, roadway there. 
just as perilous were the fortified buildings where Japanese Marines used the higher floors to target the advancing Americans, dropping Molotov cocktails on the streets below. Quote, the preferred solution was to use cannons to blast the upper floors to rubble and then move in, one infantry officer said. An equally favored alternative was to just burn the building. When these alternatives wouldn't work, riflemen moved in to take the building floor by floor. Between Japanese demolitions and American artillery, Manila was being destroyed from the inside and the out. Men, women, and children who could fled. Others retreated below ground where conditions inside cramped air raid shelters devolved as the hours turned to days. Bunkers built to house a single family often held multiple. And of course, such shelters proved easy prey for marauding Japanese troops who often lobbed explosives inside. That was the case for this gentleman here whose cheek was literally ripped off by shrapnel from a grenade tossed inside his shelter. Many others proved too injured to walk, including this woman here, who was literally placed in a basket by her neighbors for transportation to an aid station. It was during this time that many of the worst atrocities took place, as Japanese troops slaughtered thousands of residences, re uh, residents at places ranging from the German Club and St. Paul's College to De La Salle and inside Intramuros. The Pearl of the Orient, day by day, hour by hour, was being destroyed. By the morning of February 23rd, American forces had isolated the last of Iwabuchi's troops inside Intramuros and a handful of surrounding government buildings. The fight to retake the walled city began with a massive artillery barrage at 7.30 a.m., one so destructive it blackened the sky turning day into night. Afterward, assault troops moved in, fighting amid the rubble, often using flamethrowers, which ended up being one of the more popular weapons inside the urban fight. Once inside Intramuros, troops discovered that the survivors were almost exclusively women and children. War crimes investigators later determined that the Japanese had killed an estimated 4,000 men inside the walled city in the days leading up to the assault. With Intramuros finally secured, American troops moved on to retake the legislature, finance, and agricultural buildings. The last of those finally fell on March 3rd, bringing an end to the Battle of Manila, 29 days after it had started. The fight to retake the capital had resulted in the deaths of 16,665 Japanese troops. America had suffered about 1,000 killed and 5,500 wounded. But it was the civilians who bore the brunt of the horror, with an estimated 100,000 killed, many of them slaughtered in atrocities. Over the city of Manila hung that awful stench of death. Worse than the smell, remembered infantry major Chuck Hinn, was the taste of death, which settled on the tongue. No amount of spitting, he recalled, could clear it away. And this photograph, I think, here gives you really one of the best panoramics of just how extensive and how violent that destruction was. The battle from Manila had destroyed 613 city blocks, an area containing 11,000 buildings, ranging from banks, schools, churches, neighborhoods. More than 200,000 residents were left homeless. Here's a photo here of the uh, general post office, which in it, you can see the, the wreckage all around it and in the uh, river there as well. And the next slide is one of City Hall, which just shows you the violence of that fight. I mean, look at the, the shell damage to the building. It's just really extraordinary. A post-war American survey estimated that the damage to Manila by today's figures would run more than $10 billion, a price tag that in the end, neither America nor Japan wanted to pay. Beyond those structural losses, of course, were the cultural ones. From the centuries old churches 
and museums filled with priceless paintings and statues to the irreplaceable literary works. The Battle of Manila robbed the Philippines not only of much of its architecture, but also its culture and its heritage. And of course, the economy was left in shambles, a sentiment best described by Santo Tomas and Terni A.V.H. Hartendorp. Quote, the manager of one of the Manila oil companies and speaking of rebuilding his plant, stated that he would have to begin again at the beginning with a land survey. More than anything, however, was the incalculable loss to the nation's precious human capital. The doctors and lawyers, the inventors, the teachers, the artists, the moms, the dads. The Battle of Manila had a wide ranging impact on the Philippines and its people. Gone was the Pearl of the Orient, the gorgeous city that had once graced tourism brochures and steamship ads. Gone too were so many thousands of people. Lives lost, families wrecked, and a future upended. And of course, so many others would have no choice but to figure out how to move on, carrying this, the weight of those physical and emotional wounds that would never heal, but would be passed on to future generations leading up all the way to today. So thank you very much. And I will turn it back over to our uh, presenters. Thank you, Mr. James Scott. Again, if you have questions for Mr. James Scott, you may use the Q&A box for our Zoom attendees or the comment section of the Facebook live stream, and we'll try our best to accommodate them during our Q&A session later. We are again reminding everyone that some of the images to be used in the next presentation are graphic in nature and may be disturbing to some viewers. Now, let me introduce to you our next speaker, Dr. Ricardo Jose. Dr. Rico Jose is a professor with the University of the Philippines Department of History, where he specializes in the Philippines during World War II and the Japanese occupation, Philippine military and diplomatic history, and Philippine-Japan relations. Professor Rico Jose obtained his bachelor's and master's in history from the University of the Philippines and his PhD from the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. He is the author of several books, monographs and book chapters published in the Philippines and abroad. He has also obtained several awards, including the Metrobank Foundation Outstanding Filipino Teacher Award. Today, he will talk about rehabilitation and relief after the war. Take it away, Dr. Rico Jose. Okay, good morning to everyone uh, in the Philippines and to the, in the United States. Good uh, early evening. Uh, I'll be talking about what happened to us right after all that fighting. So when you see the images of the fighting and when you read about the war, most of us really just read about the war, the fighting, the losses and everything. But what happened afterwards is a story in itself and that has not been given too much attention. That is that, uh, something that, should, that we should learn from. Uh, so if we are to start, even as the fighting was going on, uh, the Commonwealth government, which had been exiled throughout most of the Japanese occupation, it, it was based in Washington, D.C. Um, the president at that time was President Osmeña in 1944 because Quezon had died in August of 1944. So it was Osmeña as vice president who took over and he returned with MacArthur to Leyte. The Commonwealth was in Tacloban from October 1944 until February 1945. One of the first things MacArthur did, once conditions stabilized in Manila a little bit, was to reinstate the government back in Malacanang, the seat of power. Uh, this was on February 27, 1945, and this was even before the fighting in Manila stopped, uh, st ended. Uh, this photograph is taken inside Malacanang Palace, and MacArthur is giving his short speech where he's turning over the reins of government and civil affairs to President Osmeña, who waits on the side. Even as this ceremony was going on, this is uh, uh, Malacanang, of course, is on the north side of the Pasig River. On the south side, fighting was still going on. Bullets could still be heard flying around, and Manila was not particularly safe at that time. The Commonwealth government had a lot of activities to work on. And it's amazing how 
Osmania took this challenge without really giving up. Osmania, in fact, seems to be the president, Philippine president, who probably had the most difficult task of all the Philippine presidents. What did he have to do? He had to reestablish the government. He had to reestablish confidence in that government. And then he had very little funds. In fact, for clothing, notice that he is wearing U.S. Army khaki uniform because there was nothing else left to wear at that time. Most government officials, in fact, would be wearing khaki uniforms most of the time. The U.S. Army still controlled most of the activity since the war was still going on. There was an organization called the PICAO, the Philippine Civil Affairs Unit, which was assisting people and trying to restart local government where the Commonwealth government couldn't reach. There was also the counterintelligence corps of the U.S. Army, which was beginning to screen collaborators and checking for spies. So Osmania had this very difficult position, very limited funds, very little limited equipment, hardly any vehicles, few facilities, most of the government buildings destroyed, and the predominance of the U.S. Army because the war was still going on. Even before the war ended, in fact, Congress was called to session because the Philippines was still a democracy despite the war. Osmania had emergency powers, but he did not want to use them. And he wanted to keep the Philippine democratic ideals alive. So therefore, the Congress was called in, uh, to session in July of 1945. Here is a picture of that first session of the Congress. The members of Congress and Senate had been elected in November of 1941, just before the war, but they had never been able to take their oath of office. And here was their first real meeting. When they met, however, some of the members were either dead, others had been accused of collaboration and could not attend. And of course, the Philippine legislative building was in ruins. It was still smoking as this was going on. So this particular session was held in the former Japanese school. So this was a, a Japanese property which the Philippine government now took over. Uh, the government had to take into consideration price controls, supply and demand, and the alleviation of difficult lives of the people. So relief was the need of the hour. And as the, as the Commonwealth government took over, its uh, responsibilities in civil affairs, the Philippine Civil Affairs Unit or the PICAO was operating very strongly in areas that the Commonwealth government could not reach yet. This is what life was like in the ruins. So as was uh, shown earlier, uh, Manila was uh, easily 75% to 80% of Manila was in ruins and people had to make their lives amidst these ruins. Uh, some would say this is where the squatter phenomenon started because so many people lost their homes and they could not find shelter. They had to make sh their shelters wherever they could find. So the Philippine Civil Affairs Unit had to establish branches all over the Philippines uh, in Leyte first and then in Lingayen and Pangasinan and then moving down to Central Luzon and into Manila. And then as the rest of the Philippines was freed from Japanese control, they established Picao branches in Cebu, in Mindanao, and uh, the other Visayan Islands. So these are pictures showing the many activities of the Picao at that time. One was to distribute rice. Rice still had to be rationed. Even food, which was in short supply, had to be rationed. And if the government couldn't do it yet, then Picao stepped in. The PICAO also provided for emergency medical services. Uh, they provided for civilian hospitals. They provided early doctors to provide first aid and initial medical services. So food was brought in. Later on, we would get more food from the U.S. and then the U.S. Army. Donors would provide more food. And later on, even from the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. Uh, one basic problem was water. Where would the people get water? Uh, when the Battle of Manila ended, there was virtually no source of water, and the agency that stepped in to provide immediate water supplies was the U.S. Army, which provided huge tanks like this and uh, water distribution points like this with a pipe and several faucets from this. So you have these children waiting for their buckets to be filled. There are many other pictures showing several other uh, tanks like this and cisterns, which were set up not only in Manila, but also in Baguio and other cities that were ravaged by the war.
The American GIs brought their own food, which excited many Filipinos. Sea rations, which we had not tasted, was something very exciting to uh, uh, Filipinos. And one thing that the American GIs brought with them, something that's still very popular with Filipinos today, spam. Filipinos had not tasted this at all. And spam was a wartime product in the United States, easy to preserve, and Filipinos loved it. So Filipinos traded eggs, live chickens, and other, uh, other products for the Americans who by this time were so sick and tired of spam that they were willing to give it all up. So food was distributed. This is uh, one of the Picao centers. No, this is not an SAP line. And notice that there's no social distancing here. Uh, this is a rice distribution point in a movie theater in, Metro, in Manila. So rice was distributed, medical teams were established, and the Picao was behind most of these when the Philippine Commonwealth government could not establish itself. The Philippine government would also put up what was called the Emergency, uh, emergency Services Administration, uh, which would take care of these immediate needs. So here again is Picao. This is a Picao doctor and he's a nurse taking care of Filipi a wounded Filipino. Incidentally, the Picao was essentially a Filipino organization uh, help, which was staffed by Filipinos basically from the United States. Many of them had volunteered and they came back to Leyte and elsewhere. The officers were basically American, but, uh, but the, uh, the, the Filipinos were the bulk of these Picao or, or the Philippine Civil Affairs Unit organizations. So water distribution, food distribution, medicine. Another basic problem was electricity. Uh, with all the electrical wires destroyed in the fighting, uh, not just in Manila, but all throughout the Philippines, there was no electrical power. In, the, in Manila, one of the big battles was for the Miranco generating plant in Provisor Island. That was totally destroyed. And so therefore, there was no electricity for the first few months immediately after the fighting. What the Americans did was they sent one destroyer here and the destroyer would establish, uh, would link up with the electrical wire system and the generators of that destroyer, supplemented by a second destroyer later on, would bring in the first electrical power to the city of Manila. This is very limited. So a larger capacity generator, the impedance, a floating generator, that's, this, that's it in the picture. This was uh, sent from the United States all the way to Manila. Uh, and it arrived and it became the major generating plant of the city of Manila for until Meralco was able to uh, re-establish its foundations. Uh, fortunately, the basic water and uh, some of the electrical supplies had not fully been destroyed by the Japanese, although they had tried to destroy it. The dam at Novaliches, the uh, dam at Wawa, and the dam, uh, Ipo Dam, these were fought for by Filipino and American uh, soldiers fighting side by side. And this was able, uh, they were able to rescue most of the water and the generating plants at uh, Kaliraya and elsewhere. So uh, the floating generator, the impedance, was a unique facility here. Uh, and then communications lines had to be restored. Again, the U.S. Army Signal Corps was at the forefront of all of this. They needed, of course, communications for the Army units, but very quickly, Philippine Long Distance and Telephone Company, PLDT, would also try to step in and try to restore its own lines, uh, provided they get, got the materials. The problem, of course, was especially serious insofar as health and hygiene were concerned. Hospitals were main, mainly destroyed, and the sanitation in the city was almost non-existent. With all the dead bodies lying around, the city soon, soon smelled of rotting flesh and everything. And rats, flies populated the city more than they did people. So the U.S. Army decided to send a, a fleet of uh, C-47 aircraft and spray DDT over Manila to kill all of the rats and all the pests. So these are, there were four, of, there were four planes that flew over Manila. And these are, this is at flight, this was in early March of 1945, to kill all the germs in Manila. Of course, this was before they found out that DDT was also dangerous to people. But this tended to stabilize at least the hygiene in Manila at that time. Clothing was a very big problem at that time. 
uh, almost all the clothes had been destroyed, that they were gone, uh, homes were destroyed, and so the people didn't have anything to wear. So one of the most uh, popular pieces of clothing were the uh, khaki uniforms that the Americans gave Filipino men. But another source of clothing were the extra parachutes, which were either thrown away because they had already been used and they could no longer be reused. And uh, uh, this picture shows a friend of mine, Joan Orenda Inn and her siblings, wearing dresses and clothes made out of parachute, nylon. They are accompanied by an American soldier who's in khaki uniforms. So as time went on, by about June or July of 1945, uh, the battle had now moved to other areas. The United Nations Relief and Re Rehabilitation Administration sent supplies to the Philippines. This included supplies of wheat, supplies of uh, seeds, and other basic commodities that Filipinos could now use to reinforce their food supplements. Uh, one big problem, of course, was the UNRRA, which still exists incidentally, was providing a lot of flour and bread and Filipinos are not used to flour and bread. So for a while, uh, we had all of this flour to provide bread to the Philippines. And then from these supplies, gradually Filipinos were able to settle the basic relief uh, problems uh, immediately after the months of the fighting. After this, however, a big problem was how to survive in the ruins. If the basic needs were now being met, how was one to re-establish normalcy in the city, in the ruins? One thing that had to be done very quickly was to clean up the streets of Manila. In some areas, bulldozers were used to clean up the rubble, but in other places, such as this, this is uh, near Rizal Avenue, some of it had to be done by hand, looking for scrap metal, looking for unexploded mines, looking for bullets, and this had to be done by hand, manually. So this had to be done in various streets, again, not only in Manila, but also in Davao and Cebu and elsewhere. So as the cleaning up went on, business had to re be restarted. And so business uh, entrepreneurs would establish businesses even amidst the ruins. Whatever they could find, whatever they could salvage, they would provide and uh, whatever little furniture they had, they would... Uh, used to provide a makeshift stall and provide food or whatever they could find. Interestingly enough, one of the businesses, one of the business propositions that came up very quickly was to provide liquor or whiskey to the American soldiers who were extremely thirsty. Unfortunately, a lot of this was bootleg or ersatz liquor, which actually proved dangerous to one's health. A number of people died with it, and so it had to be banned for a while. But Again, one had to make, one had to survive, one had to live in the ruins. And one way of doing this was, of course, you had to continue your basic daily routine, one of which was washing clothes. You had to keep clean anyway. The only source of water initially were fire hydrants. So you have these women washing clothes, uh, sometimes their own clothes, their own family's clothes, but sometimes also washing clothes for the American soldiers. So the fire hydrants initially provided water and then later on the American water tanks and as the water supply was restored, this could now be piped into the homes that were still surviving at the time. But there was still quite a lot of optimism despite all the destruction. And again, business had to be established. Stores were established. Uh, some of them were makeshift, but some of them were a little more longer lasting. This was uh, one of the early bookstores then. It was mostly American magazines, Newsweek and Time and others. Uh, but from stalls like this, we would have National Bookstore and Popular Bookstore rising up. Both of those were born in 1945 amidst the ruins of the war. So business would start, would you start? Uh, restaurants and cafes, some of them catering to Americans, some of them catering to Filipinos, some of them catering to both. Uh, Max restaurant is one of the products of 1945. Uh, this is an interesting picture of a small snack bar in Pangasinan. This is near Lingayen. And this was established already after the atomic bomb was dropped. Notice the name, Atomic Lunch Bar. You have American soldiers and Filipina 
and an American and a Filipino in the background. So the Atomic Lunch Bar was one of many small eating places that re-established themselves. And then again, business had to pick, pick business had to pick up. Uh, some of these businesses would be shown in the ads of the times because despite everything, people thirsted for information, people thirsted for news. And one of the first things that did come out were newspapers and even magazines. This came out, these are ads that came out in Liwayway in about June of 1945. Look at the ads that are being sold, uh, that are selling things. You have Mafran, which is now uh, banana ketchup. Uh, they were, didn't call itself banana ketchup yet, but just so, sar, uh, sarsa. Soft drinks, locally made soft drinks, a dress shop, and Auntie Buy Shoes, which was already resuming business to provide footwear for Filipinos and Americans. And aside from Auntie Buy Shoes, we also had hand craftsmen making bakya. During the war, because uh, footwear proved to be very short in supply, people didn't have shoes and sandals anymore, the bakya turned out to be a very important piece of footwear because it was heavy duty, it was durable. And towards the end of the war, you had some of the carvers in Paete making bakya this ornate, showing Philippine scenery. Some of these they sold to American soldiers and it wound up, they wound up in the United States. Transportation would also be uh, reintroduced. Initially, military transportation. We hitched rides on jeeps or trucks. Uh, some of the trucks were eventually turned over to Filipinos who established bus companies. Uh, one of the bus companies from 1945 was Victory Bus Liner. That's why it's called Victory, because 1945. And then the early jeepneys came out. This is one of the earliest pictures of a jeepney in post-war Manila. This was in May 1946, and behind it is the, are the ruins of the legislative building. Even the air, uh, air transport was starting to pick up in late 1945. Philippine Airlines, the pre-war airline, was able to fly again only in 1946, but the airline that started business in 1945 was FEATI, Far Eastern Air Transportation Incorporated. Now, Few of us remember that that was an airline. It's now a university now. So the early jeepneys, other forms of transportation began to come around. And as the uh, free end areas were, uh, as the free areas increased in number, then the new Philippine money was circulated. These were basically the pre-war design, but you now have an overprint victory, which shows that this is now the legal tender replacing the Mickey Mouse money that the Japanese had circulated during the war. Again, the signet, what, another difference from the pre-war money is the uh, signatory here is Sergio Osmeña, now as president of the Philippines. Uh, salvage, reopening of banks, the stock market was uh, something that had to be uh, reopened as soon as possible. Philippine gold reserves that had been brought to the United States were returned to the Philippines. And the silver peso hoard in Corregidor, which had been dumped into the sea, was recovered, or much of it was recovered. There was a great deal of rebuilding that had to take place, and it had to be done very quickly. Among the things that had to be rebuilt very quickly were the bridges over the Pasig River. As long as there were no bridges over the Pasig River, one could not connect North and South Manila. And the first bridge that linked North and South Manila was actually a pontoon bridge on barges, on pontoons, float, a floating bridge, which was in uh, Nagtahan. That's now Nagtahan Bridge, but that was a floating bridge before. This is uh, U.S. Army engineers building a Bailey Bridge over the ruins of Jones Bridge. And many of these bridges would be put up very quickly. Even Quezon Bridge, which had been blasted by the Japanese, would be uh, connected with a temporary wooden bridge. Uh, Movie houses, other buildings, uh, even movie houses had to be rebuilt. Uh, this is a movie house outside Manila. And uh, what is interesting is that it's still showing uh, Road to Morocco, even as the construction is going on. So movies were important because they provided an outlet for Filipinos and they allowed us to forget about the current concerns. But there was need for long-term planning. Agriculture had to be rehabilitated. 
So seeds and farm animals had to be brought in. One forgotten casualty of the war were the farm animals, the carabaos, the cows that had been lost due, due to the war. These had to be imported and the farm agriculture had to be restored. Uh, insofar as the cities, they had to be reconstructed and the architect and uh, chief city engineer of Manila, uh, Ar architect Kayanan, would issue a brochure called Planning Our Towns and Cities, in which he tried to lay out the guidelines for reconstructing the cities of the Philippines, that it had to be planned on very solid grounds, that, prince, uh, that basic uh, policies had to be followed. And the other picture here is a, a, a screenshot from a documentary showing the uh, planning of a city. Uh, they built up ar architectural models. And then schools had to be reopened. Uh, during the Japanese occupation, schools were reopened by the Japanese, but very few children went to school. Uh, most parents were afraid of their children to go out into the streets, and so most of them stayed home. When schools could be reopened, the problem was about 80% of the school buildings were destroyed by the war. And the surviving buildings were taken over by U.S. Army uh, officials as hospitals and headquarters. So very few school buildings could actually be used. So they, schools had to, be, had to use whatever facilities were available to them. This is a school in Pangasinan, which has reopened just about a month after the uh, U.S. Army forces landed. So the school year would reopen on July of 1945. And primary schools would open, usually under tents, and even schools, higher education colleges would also reopen, such as UP. UP's buildings were almost totally destroyed in the Battle of Manila. So these are UP School of Engineering uh, majors who are draft, doing their drafting in one of the corridors of Philippine General Hospital. Because they had no building, their building was wrecked. And so here they are uh, doing their homework, doing their classwork in PGH. Others would conduct classes under the uh, under tents. Uh, libraries were destroyed, of course, and many of the school equipment and facilities were also destroyed. But people helped in re-establishing the schools. And uh, one thing that one interesting phenomenon is that people who had forgotten to uh, return their books, who had overdue books now returned their books to libraries which had no books at all. And so they were looked on as heroes at the time for saving the books of the, uh, these libraries. And aside from all this, there was a great deal of freedom of speech that was restored. During the Japanese occupation, everything was censored. The radio, the uh, newspapers, even uh, conversation was monitored. So the advent of liberation brought with it the flourishing of newspapers. Most of them were new. So look at the names here, Guerrilla, Liberator, Bagong Buhay. These are all post-war newspapers. Some of them had actually started as guerrilla newspapers uh, being printed in the mountains. Uh, some of them would die very shortly after the war, but some of them continued on to live a healthy life, such as the Manila Chronicle. Uh, Filipinos still had to be entertained, of course. And aside from the uh, gossip and so forth, Movies and theaters were one way of really relaxing. These are ads from uh, various theaters in 1945. Uh, one of them is in Malolos, October 1945. Uh, look at the movie, it's on to Tokyo. Rogelio de la Rosa was very popular at that time and Norma Blanca Flor as well. Uh, the other one is a theater in Malabon, a classic war movie, Back to Bataan with John Wayne. Uh, August 6 to August 12. Very fascinating, just about the period we're, talk we're living in right now. But notice, it says, if weather permits. That probably means that this, the roof was still destroyed and that if it rained, then they'd have to cancel the show. So the movies went, came back and song hits. People we began singing songs, happy songs. The songs that we had heard at the beginning of the program, all of those are 1945 uh, music. And this is one of the earliest songbooks that was printed in 1945 here in the Philippines. This is not an American publication, but it was a Filipino publication. Most of these were, of course, American song hits, but 
uh, the, this tended to give people a more optimistic outlook and a, really a way to survive. But the war was still on. And although the military campaigns were declared closed on July 4, 1945, there still was the necessity of helping the war. And so posters like this came up to urge people to still rally behind the soldiers, help them continue fighting the war. And before the atomic bomb was dropped, at the Philippines was a major staging point for fuel, ammunition, supplies, for the invasion of Japan. If the atomic bombs were not dropped, the Philippines would be the major source of all of these supplies for the invasion of Japan. We even volunteered a whole division of Filipino soldiers to fight in the first invasion of the Japanese mainland. And they were training at this particular point. But the atomic bombs were dropped. Everyone was surprised about this. Uh, nobody knew what an, what an atomic bomb was. Uh, so people were just using the word so casually at that time. Uh, cafes, restaurants were called themselves atomic. Even publications were called atomic at that time. And finally, Japan decided to accept the conditions of the Allies. That led to a great deal of rejoicing that now the war was finally over. Uh, this is the issue of Free Philippines, a U.S. Army newspaper which declared that the war was now over. Notice that it's dated August 14. The official Japanese acceptance took place actually on August 15. Rumors of the Japanese negotiations to surrender had been circulating as early as August 9 and August 10. So celebrations were taking place at various times. And when the news came up, then there was massive rejoicing at the end of the war. Now, the formal end of the war would still take place on September 2 in Tokyo Bay. And in the Philippines, General Yamashita would come down on September 2 in the afternoon and sign the surrender documents in Baguio in September 3. Uh, other areas, the Japanese would surrender in various areas all the way through late September. Celebrations would take place everywhere from the north to the south. This is a victory parade in Tacloban. And names changed. Atomic was the popular word, word in, 19, in August 1945, but by September it was no longer atomic. It was now VJ or victory over Japan. So the atomic lunch and bar became VJ lunch and bar, now serving ice cream. But still there, was a lot, there were a lot of problems, administratively, collaboration, and all of these, which were now in the hand, which were still in the hands of the United States, were suddenly turned over to the Philippine government. And from that point on, the collaboration cases and the war crimes trials would be held in the Philippines. Filipinos who served in the guerrillas or in the army were now discharged. And so we had that discharge paper uh, being shown. But there would be problems as a result of this. Some would not be recognized. Others would be, uh, would be taken off the lists and you'd have problems with veterans' recognition. But there were things to look forward to, at least. There was rehabilitation money that we could look forward from the United States. The United States had actually promised, uh, Roosevelt had promised, to pay for every Carabao and every Baha'i Kubo lost when the war started. And there was reparations money that we could expect from Japan. So all was not lost. There was some optimism and there were cases where Filipinos could still look forward to the near future. Of course, this would lead to, uh, there would be many other serious problems, but at this particular point, Filipinos picked up what they could recover and began to live again. Now they could, however, breathe freely. They could move around without censorship and without uh, a foreign occupying power. So with that, let me thank all of you and good morning. Good evening in, other, in the US. Thank you, Dr. Rico Jose. Again, if you have questions for Dr. Ricardo Jose, you may use the Q&A box for Zoom attendees or the comment section of the Facebook live stream and we'll try our best to accommodate them during the Q&A session later.
We are again reminding everyone that some of the images in the presentation are graphic in nature and may be disturbing to some viewers. Lastly, joining us from California, USA, is our last speaker, Ms. Cecilia Gerland. Ms. Cecilia Gerland is the founder and executive director of the Bataan Legacy Historical Society, which aims to educate the public on the historical significance of Bataan in World War II in the Philippines. She was inspired by her father, Luis Gerland Jr., a veteran of World War II and a survivor of the Bataan Death March. Bataan Legacy Historical Society has received commendations from California legislators, including a proclamation from Governor Jerry Brown. She is also a playwright, a novelist, and an experienced travel organizer. Today, she'll be talking about justice and the situation of the veterans. To kick off her presentation, let us watch this short video. Magandang umaga po sa Pilipinas. Good evening or good afternoon in the United States. Uh, I want to thank uh, the staff of the Filipino Heritage Library uh, headed by uh, Susan Yupanko for this great uh, work in putting up this webinar. I also want to thank the sponsors, Ayala Foundation, the U.S. Embassy, and of course, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. So um, I'm here to talk about justice for the Filipinos and for the veterans. So I will talk a bit about the declassification of war crimes records, 
uh, as well as some of the uh, uh, Japanese officers who were convicted and some who were not convicted. So in 1998, uh, the United States Congress mandated the largest declassification of war crimes records in history. So in October 1988, they passed a uh, public law 105-246 for the Nazi uh, records declassification. And then December 27, 2000, public law 106-567 the declassification of the imperial Japanese government records. And as a result of this, uh, 8.5 million records were open to the public under this mandate. And uh, the final report was actually published in 2007. So why are there fewer classified records about Japan compared to Germany? Um, in a lot of schools, when they teach about World War II, um, they talk about the European, European theater and, of course, the war crimes that happened in Europe. Uh, but until the publication of um, The Rape of Nanking and Now Rampage, uh, not too many people uh, know of the war crimes that took place in Asia uh, during World War II. So anyway, 8 million pages for the Nazi war crimes uh, were declassified and 100,000 pages for the Imperial Army. So why is there such a huge discrepancy? Well, the U.S. military and not the Office of Strategic Services had control of most of the records uh, in the Pacific theater. And then fewer Japanese war criminals, uh, fewer war criminal records of the Japanese. Uh, there were few of them because there was not a continuing hunt, unlike the, uh, the Nazi war criminals. So as a result, the CIC, the counterintelligence corps, the CIA and FBI did not create uh, dossiers on a large number of these Japanese individuals. Also, uh, the records of the other nations' uh, war crimes trial, for example, uh, in India, are not subject to disclosure because they were never in the possession of the U.S. government. And then also the return to Japan of all the Japanese records in the late 50s and early 60s. If you remember, uh, in September, on September 8, 1951, the Treaty of San Francisco or the Treaty of Peace with Japan was signed here in San Francisco, uh, in the Bay Area where I am. Uh, and it became effective on April 28, 1952, which ended the American occupation of Japan and reestablish the um, uh, peaceful relations between Japan and the Allied nations. And then another reason is also the destruction of Japanese military, naval, and government documents. So between August 15, 1945, the secession, uh, when, when Japan surrendered, and the arrival of the small advance uh, parties of American troops, the occupying troops in Japan. On August 28, the first uh, party arrived on August 28, 1945. Japanese military and civil authorities systematically destroyed military, naval, and government archives especially from the period 1942 to 1945. And the Imperial General Headquarters in Tokyo dispatched and ciphered messages to the field commands throughout the Pacific and East Asia, ordering the units to burn incriminating evidence of war crimes. And then in 2003, Japan's military history archives of the National Institute for Defense Studies estimated 
that 70% of the Army's wartime records were either burned or destroyed. So there were, um, these are just a few of the um, uh, war, war criminals or the Japanese officers actually who were convicted in the Manila Military War Crimes Tribunal. Uh, next slide. Held at the U.S. High Commissioner's Office. So this was the U.S. High Commissioner's Office, which is now the U.S. Embassy. And so on September 24, 1945, under the authority of the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Army Forces in the Pacific, General MacArthur, and Lieutenant General Wilhelm Steyer, uh, Commanding General of the U.S. Army Forces in Western Pacific, uh, five commission members, all generals, were appointed to adjudicate this uh, military war crime trial. Four Americans and one Filipino, Major Basilio Valdez. So this was convened on October 8, 1945. Uh, and of course, we also had the International uh, Military Tribunal of the Far East, or what's commonly called as the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal, uh, which took place in Sugamo, near Tokyo, Shanghai, Manila, and Guam. Uh, 140 men were convicted in these four locations, 28 of which were Class A uh, war crimes or crimes against humanity. So uh, the defense for General Yamashita uh, Major John Skeen and Captain uh, George Furness actually applied for a writ of habeas corpus with the U.S. Supreme Court to dismiss the charges, but the justices decided to reject the uh, application. Actually, two justices of the U.S. Supreme Court dissented, dissented but Chief Justice Stone cited the commander's responsibility outlined in the Hague Conventions of 1907, as well as the 1929 Geneva Convention. So this was the first time that command responsibility was uh, used. And so we have here uh, General Masaharu Homa, who was the commanding general of the uh, 14th Army. And he was actually appointed in November of 1941 and, um, and uh, left in August of 1942. Uh, previous to that, he took part in the Second Sino War, the Battle of Wuhan, which remains the largest and most significant battle of the Second Sino-Japanese War from 15th of July, 1938 to December 2, 1940. That's the date for the uh, Battle of um, Wuhan. And the casualties on both sides, Chinese and Japanese, uh, I think it amounted to about 1.2 million. And then uh, after that, he was posted in Formosa. And then from 6th of November, to August 1, 1942, as I said, he was in the Philippines. He was given 50 days to capture the Philippines. And then, of course, we all know that that didn't happen. So despite uh, uh, suffering from uh, starvation, disease, the troops of the U.S. Army forces in the Far East were able to hold on to Bataan for 99 days. So the Imperial General Headquarters was unhappy about his performance. So they sent General Takachi, Takajiwachi, who was also a convicted war criminal uh, subsequently, uh, to replace the uh, Chief of Staff, General Lieutenant General Masami Ma Maeda on February 20, 1942. Uh, Wachi, by the way, was Homa's Chief of Staff in Formosa. And then he was put in reserve actually on August, upon his return. He retired on August 31st, but he was recalled as the Minister of Information, 
on December 1943. He was arraigned on December 19, 1945, tried between January 3 and February 11, 1946, executed on April 3, 1946 in Los Baños by musketry. And then the following officers um, that you will see are actually intertwined. Most of them have served with the Kwantung Army, that's the Japanese Army in Manchukuo or Manchuria. And the Kwantung Army was actually created as a result of the uh, Portsmouth Treaty, you know, after the uh, Russo-Japanese War from 1904 to 1905. And it was created for the protection of Japanese interests, including the South Manchurian Railway. So it was composed of officers who were very militant and actually it, it acted like a semi-autonomous army because it um, did not obey a lot of the uh, military, the rules coming from Tokyo. And several, actually three, were implicated in a coup on February 36, 1936 uh, by officers of the Kodoha movement, which killed two uh, former prime ministers, but they failed to assassinate the, uh, the current prime minister at that time. So Tomoyuki Yamashita was actually the uh, commanding general from September 26, 1944, he arrived on October 9, to um, until his surrender on September 2nd or September 3rd when he signed the uh, uh, the uh, surrender papers, and he was also the head of Camp Tai, the military secret police. So, but let me give you a background on Yamashita because. Um, the past, uh, during the past, the Battle of Manila and the carnages that resulted at that time were blamed on Admiral uh, or Rear Admiral Sanji Iwabuchi. Uh, and um, they say that he uh, dis uh, disobeyed orders. But actually, this is a pattern that has been going on since the uh, occupation of Manchukuo. Uh, it started the uh, army, um, the way the army dealt with insurgents uh, was actually uh, formed the, in 1932. Uh, and then it was used uh, as a mopping up, um, uh, for mopping up operations to deal with the insurgents. And then, of course, we saw what happened in uh, 1937 in the Battle of Shanghai, the Battle of Nanking, uh, and Wuhan, uh, the, uh, what happened to the civilians in, in China. So anyway, uh, Yamashita was actually in Manchukuo in 1931. And he was there during the Mukden incident. And then he was also the supreme advisor of the military government section in Manchukuo. As I said, he was implicated during the February 26, 1936 incident. And then between 1937 and 38, he was there during the Second Sino-Japanese War, the Battle of Shanghai. And then he was in charge of insurgency between 1938 and 39 as chief of staff of the North China Area Army. And then of course, he was appointed as the commanding general of the uh, 25th Army. He was called the Tiger of Malaya for the speedy conquest of Singapore and Malaya in 1942. And he was also in charge of the army during the Sukching massacre, just one of the many massacres that took place in that area. So the Sukching massacre killed approximately about, about 50,000 civilians. And then, of course, he came to the Philippines, uh, September 26, arriving on the 9th of October, 
And, you know, upon his arrival, uh, there started a series of uh, massacres of civilians, especially those suspected of being guerrillas or aiding guerrillas. And then he was arrested on September 3rd and executed on February 23, 1946. And then the next uh, uh, person, Colonel Akira Nagahama, was the commander-in-chief of the Kempetai, the military police, uh, from October 13, 1942 until January of 1945. Uh, he was arraigned uh, January 17, 1946, tried between February 25 to 11th of March, 1946, and hanged um, in Laguna on 31 of March, 1947. Of course, he was in charge of the Kempeitai, the dreaded secret police, who was uh, responsible for um, the zonifications, uh, the torture of, um, of uh, a lot of civilians and prisoners of war, as well as uh, 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 many others. And then the next one is uh, Akira Muto, General Muto. General Muto was actually uh, part also of the intelligence section of the Kwantung Army before the uh, uh, Mukden incident, before the start of the Second Sino-Japanese War. Uh, and then so he was there with General Iwani uh, Matsui during the Shanghai and Nanking massacres. And then of course he was um, also in the 25th Army. He was military commander of Northern Sumatra, 25th Army, as I said, was under the uh, command of General Yamashita at that time. And then when General Yamashita uh, was assigned to the Philippines, Muto became um, his chief of staff. He was hanged in Sogamo prison in Japan on December 23, 1948. Now, not prosecuted. There were a few... Um, uh, uh, officers who were not prosecuted, one of which was uh, Lieutenant General Akira Nara of the 65th Mixed Infantry Brigade. By the way, he was a classmate of General Vicente Lim in 1927 at the U.S. Infantry School in Fort Benning. And then, so anyway, he was there. He was in Bataan. He was there during the Pantingan River Massacre, of course, the Bataan Death March. And uh, he died in 1964. There's, it's very difficult to get any records uh, pertaining to the Pantingan, his involvement in the Pantingan River Massacre. And actually, I just asked, uh, I made a request to the CIA Freedom of Information Act to get his records, of which uh, it was denied. Uh, they neither confirmed nor denied the existence of his records. And then uh, the next one is Colonel Masanobu Suji. And, you know, he served under General Yamashita of the 20, in the 25th Army during the Sukching Massacre. He was never prosecuted. And then after uh, Singapore, he was assigned to the Philippines, actually, to keep watch on General Homa. Uh, with General Wachi because they were unhappy with uh, General Homa. Uh, Imperial General Headquarters thought that he was too soft. Uh, anyway, so, but there are records about uh, Suji uh, with the CIA Freedom of Information Act. Uh, he is thought to have uh, caused the deaths during the Bataan Death March, the atrocities as well as the execution of Chief Jose Abad Santos. And he was also um, uh, responsible for atrocities in Malaya, Guadalcanal, and Burma. And he was wanted by the British for his role in the Sukching massacre, but uh, his name was uh, taken, was deleted by the, uh, in the War Criminals Act by orders of the Supreme Commander uh, Escap. And then he became a member, uh, a member of the Diet from 1952 uh, until his, he disappeared 
1961. And then I have to go um, very fast to the um, uh, Recession Act. So the Recession Act was uh, legislation which affected all of those Filipinos who served during World War II in the Philippines. Prior to that, if you remember, uh, July 26, 1941, uh, the, uh, there was an order to create uh, USAFE, U.S. Army Forces in the Far East, which uh, incorporated all uh, Filipino um, organized uh, military units into the U.S. Army. However, uh, following a report by uh, the Administrator of Veterans Affairs, General Omar Bradley, uh, this was upon the request of two Democratic senators who were very conservative, Senators Carl Hayden, and who was the acting chairman of Appropriations Committee at that time, and Senator Richard Russell of Georgia. So the VA, or the Veterans Affairs, uh, estimated that the cost of giving benefits to all the Filipinos was going to be $3 billion. So that's $43 billion uh, in today's cost. So the first Recession Act was actually passed in January of 1946, but uh, President Truman did not sign it. It was vetoed by Truman. But the same Recession Act was passed in February uh, 18 of that year, and this time President Truman signed it on the 20th. And in it, uh, a legislative writer was attached for the transfer of some 200 million for the pay of the Army of the Philippines. And President Truman actually uh, realized that the passage and approval of this legislation would not release the United States from its moral obligation to provide for the heroic Philippine veterans who sacrificed so much for the common cause during the war. And Carlos Romulo, who was then resident commissioner, spoke uh, in the U.S. Congress and called this Recession Act an act of discrimination against the Filipinos. He rejected the 200 million. And then the following year, President Truman again addressed the Senate and Congress to provide a more satisfactory program of benefits relating to active service. Uh, since then, uh, it has, uh, there have been some benefits. Uh, first of all, uh, 1990, uh, these are, I, I'm mentioning the ones here in the United States uh, with the health benefits. Uh, 1990 saw the naturalization of approximately 20,000 Filipino veterans, but of course in 1990, majority have passed on. Uh, 1999, uh, the Social Security Act, which uh, provided special benefits for the World War, certain World War II veterans. And then in 2003, the VA, the Veterans Administ uh, Affairs, extended the health benefits to qualified Filipino war veterans. And then in 2009, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was signed by President Obama, uh, providing for a one-time lump sum payment. Uh, they appropriated 198 or approximately 200 million, the same amount that was uh, offered uh, in uh, 1946. Uh, out of the um, claims, uh, 42,755 claims were received. And uh, actually, 44% uh, uh, was approved, only 44%. The rest were denied. As I said, uh, many uh, World War II veterans had passed on at that time. So in the U.S., uh, about 9,313 uh, received the 15,000. That was for those living in the United States. And for those living in the Philippines, uh, 9,000. And then um, let me talk about the uh, public law 114-265, uh, the Congressional Gold Medal uh, for the Filipino veterans during World War II. This does not repeal the Recession Act. However, it's the highest uh, 
honor given to uh, civilians, the Congressional Gold Medal. This was spearheaded by the Filipino Veterans Recognition and Education Project, and it provided uh, for an appropriation of only $13,000 to mint one gold coin, which will be displayed at the Smithsonian uh, Museum. And then uh, between 2014 and 2016, uh, we here in California, uh, Bataan Legacy and all of its partners, uh, worked on the revision of the California curriculum framework. Uh, this only happens every 10 to 12 years. Uh, it's a public process. It was approved on July 4, 2016 for inclusion in chapter 16 or as part of chapter 16 of the grade 11 U.S. history curriculum in California. So uh, the good news is because California and Texas are the two largest states in, uh, in the United States which uh, consumes textbooks, any changes in these two states uh, would have to be reflected in the textbooks. The publishers, the major publishers, are, are obligated to include any changes in these two states. And these books are distributed nationally, not just in California and Texas, but nationally. The bad news is in California, each school district implements its own curriculum framework uh, despite the mandate. So that's the setback. And these are the events that um, are included, the Philippine Commonwealth, the creation of USAFE on July 26, 1941, the Battle of Bataan, uh, the Bataan Death March. And by the way, we included the greater significance that it delayed the 50-day timetable of the Imperial Japanese Army by fighting in Bataan for 99 days despite suffering from major disease and starvation and without any reinforcement. And then the next one is the Hell Ships. These are unmarked uh, merchant ships used to transport American and Allied prisoners of war. Uh, they were called hell ships because conditions were so dismal. Uh, from the Philippines alone, approximately 4,500 died by friendly fire. Uh, of course, the role of the guerrillas uh, during the war. Uh, this is a picture of the hunters' guerrillas. Uh, the Leyte landing on October 20, 1944, the battles of Leyte Gulf, which remains to this day as the largest battle in naval history. And I hope people will learn about it now because nobody knows about it. And then, uh, of course, the Battle of Manila, which killed approximately 100,000 civilians in one month. And with that, thank you so much to all of you for joining in. Uh, the relationship between the United States and the Philippines is forged in blood. And it is incumbent upon us, Filipinos and Americans and all nationalities, to teach the lessons of war, especially to young people of the day, the, young, the younger generation, because they will become the leaders of tomorrow. And I call upon the educators, of the Philippines to please mandate the teaching, not just in one paragraph, but a comprehensive teaching of the sacrifices of the ancestors of the Filipino nation. We owe it to them and we owe it to future generations. And with that, I want to thank all of you, our sponsors, the Filipinas Heritage Library staff, and I'll end it with a film which commemorates the Bataan Death March, which we do here in the Bay Area. This was held at the Presidio in San Francisco, and it shows part of the Congressional Gold Medal uh, Award, one of them. Thank you so very much. I lay silent in my grave as sunsets come and go. Time lost its meaning quite some time ago. This earth that I lay under was once a battleground 
remains of men like me lay scattered all around. I hear the voices above me in steps of many feet. No one knows of our location, nor of our defeat. The children sing and play not far from where we lie. We hear their laughs and screams, and even when they cry, The sounds we hear above us are sounds of normal life. Not the sounds of bombs and bullets or casualties of strife. No sounds of screeching horses or sounds of rusty treads. Nor cries of wounded men soon to join the dead. Times have changed somewhat over the span of years. No longer do loved ones call our names accompanied by tears. We stood our ground as best we could and gave it all our worth. And one by one, we perished beneath the waiting earth. I only ask that you think of us and hopefully you will. We were soldiers then, and we are soldiers still. Cecilia Gerlan. If you have questions for Ms. Cecilia Gerlan and our previous speakers, you may use the Q&A box for our Zoom attendees or the comment section in the Facebook live stream and we'll be trying our best to answer them now in our Q&A session. Let, let me now call on our speakers, Mr. James Scott, Dr. Rico Jose, and Ms. Cecilia Gerlan and I will be giving the floor to our moderator, Ms. Des Benipayo. Again, let me call on our speakers, Sir James Scott, Dr. Rico Jose, and Ms. Cecilia Gerlan. And I now give the floor to our Q&A moderator, Ms. Desiree Benipayo. Hi, okay. Um actually for the past for the past for the Good past Good morning everyone. Sorry for that, Sophie. Hi. Okay, hi. Okay, hi, take um, it away. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> good morning, the Philippines, and good evening to our viewers in the United States. 
Today, we are very honored to uh, have heard the insightful and very informative presentations of our panelists. And uh, this topic of our history, uh, the immediate post-war years, is very seldom talked about. And maybe that is why we are flooded with a lot of questions. Overwhelmingly, we have maybe around 60, 70 questions uh, forwarded. All right, so I guess we have to begin with our limited time left. We'll try to answer uh, um, as much questions as we can. So for our first question, um, these are two questions which I consolidated for James. First question is from our viewer, Tom Graves. What possible benefit, military, political, or economic, did Japan expect from the destruction of Manila and its people? And then a follow-up question from Ms. Carlota Pashon. Was there no effort to evacuate Manila that could have spared so many innocent civilian lives? James? Yeah, and I'll actually, um, there was actually very little military value to Manila outside of its waterfront. Now, Manila does have one of the greatest deep water um, ports and anchorages in the Pacific. And that was really the benefit, that and all the warehouses and fuel depots and things like that, that it would have offered the United States Navy. Uh, the city itself, however, was largely a liability for the Americans. It had about a million people there at the time. Uh, many of them on the verge of starvation who would have needed care and food and whatnot. And so it really, the city itself did not have much in the way of a value outside of its waterfront. Now, the United States could not evacuate Manila in advance of being there because it was controlled by the Japanese. And, uh, you know, Yamashita had refused to declare Manila an open city, like what Douglas MacArthur had done at the beginning of the war. And, 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 which would have taken it off of the battlefield. Uh, and so as a result, there were Japanese troops left inside the city, but the United States could not actually evacuate it. Uh, that said, the Americans did not anticipate, at least Douglas MacArthur did not anticipate, a battle like what unfolded in Manila. In fact, he, all the way up until about February 7th, several days inside into the battle, was still believing that the Japanese were going to leave the city as he had done. So it was really sort of a confluence of all of those things together that sort of set the stage for the tragic destruction of the Battle of Manila. Right. Thank you very much, James. Um, for our next question, I'd like to address this to Ms. Cecilia Gerlan. Uh, this is a question from Alex Cruz. I'm interested in learning about resistance from Filipino guerrillas during World War II. What was their relationship with U.S. troops both during the majority of the war and the arrival of MacArthur's reinforcements. How does the position of the Philippines, being a colony of the U.S. at that time, impact their interactions? Well, actually, um, the war, I, I believe that the war in the Philippines would have lasted much longer, if not for the help of the guerrilla forces. But uh, in Luzon, however, there were um, several guerrilla groups who were in conflict with each other uh, because of uh, territorial uh, conflicts or personality conflicts. So according to the uh, guerrilla um, resistance uh, manual that was put out by the uh, uh, General uh, Willoughby's office, the most uh, decisive um, information came from the Cebu uh, and the actually Sulu guerrillas. Uh, the Cebu one, because they were able to get the uh, Shogo uh, plants, the Koga papers, which helped uh, the Americans during the uh, Battle of Leyte the Gulf. And uh, the Sulu one, uh, Colonel Suarez, uh, they were able to uh, get uh, reconnaissance information uh, and which helped in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. So, but uh, it was a very complex uh, uh, recognition of the recognition, meaning recognition by Douglas MacArthur, the Southwest Pacific Office. It was very difficult. Uh, and so the uh, American Intelligence Bureau, the Philippine, uh, Colonel William Moore, Chick Parsons, they were the ones who came early in 1943 to help uh, coordinate 
all these guerrilla groups in preparation for the impending liberation. Also to ask them about the information that the Allied forces needed, for example, uh, how many soldiers in one area, what activities they do from sunrise to sundown, number of ammunitions, all that. It, it was a very main, mainly uh, reconnaissance. But of course, we also have groups who were able to sabotage, uh, you know, some some uh, uh, Japanese installations, which sometimes resulted into retaliation against the civilians. All right. We hope, uh, Alex, you've answered your question. Um, the next question will be for Dr. Jose uh, from an anonymous center. This is. Uh, I'm going to tell you two questions also, so we can, you know, uh, make use of the time. All right, so Rico, the first question is, aside from the city of Manila, are there other cities in the Philippines which was destroyed by the retreating Japanese Imperial Army? And then the second question is, how did the cities in the Visayas, such as Cebu and in Mindanao, like Davao, uh, rise or recover from the ruins caused by the Second World War? Okay, insofar as the first question is concerned, it's only Manila that the Japanese put up a fierce battle for. Uh, the other cities were generally abandoned by the Japanese, but not after they placed uh, uh, explosives to destroy the cities. So in the case of Dumaguete, for example, the Japanese had put explosives and were prepared to detonate it. But some of the guerrillas and the American forces were able to get there in time and they, you know, just in the nick of time, they prevented the explosives from going off. In other cities, actually, the uh, agent that did most of the damage was not really the Japanese, but actually the uh, U.S. Army Air Force and the U.S. Navy. Some of the uh, pre-bombardment uh, firing of the U.S. Navy actually destroyed a lot of, for example, a part of Lingayen, uh, some Wanga, Iloilo, uh, Cebu. Uh, some of these were by American battleships, cruisers. Uh, some of them were by uh, aircraft. Uh, the city of Baguio was particularly hard hit by American Army aircraft in January through March of 1945. So most of the destruction there was really by American aircraft. Uh, Davao City was also bombed by American planes, but in general, the American planes were told to bomb military targets, and they did that, but in some cases, they went overboard and bombed more than just military targets, and the problem, of course, with bombing is you can't control the bombs, and they will land wherever the bombs would want to. So that, uh, I think, will answer that question. So there was no other major area where city fighting, urban fighting took place because the Japanese strategy was really to move up into the mountains and to hold uh, delaying action there. The second question was, I forget the second question. The second question is, um, how did the cities in Visayas uh, and Mindanao recover? Yes, so in general, if we look at the whole picture, the US government gave the Philippines what was called rehabilitation aid. Uh, this was passed in 1946 after debating on how much was to be given to the Philippines. It was decided that $400 million, which was a very large sum at that time, would be given to the Philippines for restoration of private property. And then $120 million was allocated to the Philippine government for public uh, reconstruction, bridges, roads, government buildings. So in general, if we look at the main bridges, you will usually find a plaque there which says rebuilt with American rehabilitation aid. That is all throughout the Philippines, all the way from the north, uh, Cagayan, Cagayan Valley, all the way down to Davao City, Zamboanga, and so forth. Uh, the government buildings are basically restored in as close as possible to the pre-war structures that they were. But in some cases, since probably the money was not enough, they were a little, simpli a little more simplified. So we see, for example, Davao City Hall, that's, that's a pre-war building that was reconstructed after the war. Uh, Cebu, the provincial capital, was damaged during the fighting there in 1945. That was also rebuilt after the war with American rehabilitation funds. And the same thing will go to Iloilo and Baguio and, of course, Manila. 
Right. Thank you, Dr. Jose. Our next question is for James, a little bit similar to the question for Dr. Jose. Uh, mm -hmm. Was there an estimate or a computation made by the government as to how much the destruction of buildings, infrastructure, and other properties were right after the war? May I know if the Philippines was supported by Japan and the U.S. in war damages, or was the Philippines left on their own after the war? This um, question is from Mark Sinai. Yeah. Um, yeah, Rico kind of touched on some of that with the uh, rehabilitation funds that were paid. The damage to Manila, and I can't remember the exact sum it was um, in 1945 dollars, but the damage that the U.S. estimated to property in Manila would be the equivalent today of about $10 billion. So it was a really significant damage. And the United States had actually formed a, a, a corporation to go and investigate and tally damage to churches, government buildings, residents, and things like that, uh, and to do that survey. So um, the, the cost there was, 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 was significant. Um, overall, it's important to remember that the United States spent about $12 billion on the Marshall Plan for the redevelopment of Europe. Uh, a little over $2 billion in U.S. funds went into the rebuilding of Japan. Uh, and so I think Rico had said it was about, what, $400 million, I think, for the Philippines, four or $500 million. So, yeah, far less U.S. dollars went into the rebuilding of the Philippines. And so um, and Japan did, and, and Rico, I think, can address this a little bit better probably than I can, but in 1956, the Japanese did agree to pay reparations to the Philippines, but again, it was still nothing in the amount that would have covered the significant damage that had taken place during the war there. All right, I know this is a question in most of uh, the Filipinos, the minds of most Filipinos about uh, how we were paid after the war. So we hope we have answered your questions mm -hmm. on that. Uh, the next question is on the veterans, uh, it's a veterans recognition issue, and I'd like to address this to Ms. Cecil Gerlan. What were the reasons why Truman and the U.S. Congress passed the Recession Act on February 1946, excluding all Filipino World War II vets from receiving veterans' benefits, mandated under other U.S. veterans' benefit laws? Considering that all Filipinos prior to July 4th, 1946, were U.S. nationals who were on the side of the U.S. during the entire war. This question was forwarded by Mr. Jerry Aboso. Uh, as I uh, explained uh, previously, uh, because of the staggering um, amount uh, estimated by uh, the Administrator for Veterans Affairs, which put or estimated the cost of the Filipino veterans at $3 billion. That's $43 billion in today's cost. I think uh, that was the primary reason. Uh, I cannot say if there was any discrimination. Uh, it's not up to me to, to say that, but all I can do is to present the facts and it's up to uh, the listeners or the viewers to make the judgment. Um, by the way, actually, you know, the second uh, Recession Act, which actually uh, uh, made the service of the new Philippine Scouts, because 50,000 uh, new Philippine Scouts were actually uh, recruited for the, uh, as part of the occupation, uh, occupying forces. Their service was also deemed not full-time uh, during the second uh, recession act. So uh, just just wanted to point that out. All right. Uh, Dr. Jose, uh, I probably have to ask you this question as well about veterans' benefits. Because I remember when we were discussing some time back and you mentioned that some of the uh, veterans' benefits went into the founding of the Veterans Bank? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, I didn't answer the reparations from Japan. I can answer that also mm -hmm. in passing. No? So if we look at the uh, monies that were promised us after the war, they would come from two sources. One would come from the United States, which was called Rehabilitation Fund, and the other one was uh, coming from Japan, which was called Reparations uh, Payments. So in the case of the Rehabilitation Funds, the U.S. Congress passed that very quickly. Uh, we had that by 1946. But unfortunately, uh, 
uh, several people were left out of that, which left a lot of disgust, anger, and uh, probably even disappointment with the U.S. Among those, for example, who were excluded from the rehabilitation funds were those who were not considered friendly to the United States. That is, the collaborators, of course, <laughs> nothing. And countries that were in the Philippines, had not had nationals in the Philippines, but did not contribute directly to the war or did not contribute very much, were also cons were, were removed from the uh, benefits of the rehabilitation funds. This included Spain, which was neutral all throughout the, the war, and ironically, even Britain. And uh, Britain was removed from the list, and they did not get anything. Uh, Spain, of course, a lot of the Spanish uh, heritage here in the church was a lot, was a lot, lot of that was still Spanish. They didn't get anything from these rehabilitation funds. So the, the hope of the Philippines really was that more money would come from the Japanese reparations. And uh, when we settled all the uh, claims that were here, the Philippine government came up with the sum of $8 billion as of 1946. Uh, that $8 billion was a very large amount of money at that time. Yeah, Philippine peso to dollar was two, pe two pesos to one dollar. That was 16 billion pesos. It was a lot of money, and we hoped to use that to restart the economy. Uh, there was also a plan to shift some of the Japanese factories from Mitsubishi and Hitachi and all of this from Japan, those that had survived the war, and transfer them to the Philippines so we would have an industrial policy right away. Unfortunately, the Cold War set, set in, and by 1949, the U.S. mood towards Japan was uh, changing. The government mood wanted Japan now as an ally. Remember, the Korean War started in 1950. Uh, Russia, uh, USSR had its atomic bomb in 1949. China was taken over by the communists in 1949. So it seemed like the world was in uh, very grave danger of being overrun by the communists. So the American government told the Philippine government to give up on the reparations claims. Uh, this we argued against very strongly, led to a great deal of disappointment with the U.S. And we pushed the claims, but we filed the original claim was 8 billion U.S. dollars at that time. The Japanese said they could not pay for this. Uh, there was a long winded discussion which finally ended in 1956 and that uh, got we, we got out of that only 550 million US dollars remember the claim was 8 billion dollars and we only got 550 million dollars not even in cash but in services which the Japanese wanted at first but we insisted not services you include goods so eventually, goods and services. The goods could, of course, be sold. And out of that amount of money, 20 million was earmarked for the Philippine veterans, widows, and survivors. And that was, uh, what, that was held in bulk. They could not distribute it. It was difficult to track down the veterans. So in 1963, the Philippine government decided to put it together, make use of the money that had uh, accrued from this sale of Japanese goods to the tune of $20 million and create the Veterans Bank. And so the Veterans Bank was funded, uh, used that initial fund and built up from that. So stockholders of the Veterans Bank, of course, are all World War II veterans. All the World War II veterans are automatically a part of that bank. So yes, uh, that is where the Veterans Bank got its start. All right, Dr. Jose, um, just a follow-up question uh, closely related to that from Andrew Jones. Hi, Andrew, my friend from Boston. <laughs> what happened to all the military supplies after the war ended? Yeah, okay. So remember, we were preparing for the invasion of Japan. So all the most modern equipment was coming in here, tanks, aircraft, uh, jeeps, trucks, the most modern guns and everything. They were coming in here. They were all aimed for the invasion of Japan scheduled for November of 1945 and then January 1946. Since the atomic bomb was dropped and Japan surrendered so much earlier than was expected, all of this equipment all of a sudden became what was called surplus. So the Americans did not want to take it home 
it would cost too much money to take it home and they wouldn't need it anyway. So the items that were usable to the Philippine government were turned over to the Philippine government in 1946 when we became independent. And that surplus equipment was to the tune of $100 million. That was added then to the uh, $400 million for private property and $120 million for pri uh, public property. So that $100 million worth of surplus equipment. This meant jeeps, trucks, landing ships, landing craft, which is why after the war, the bedrock of our transportation system were all these jeeps and trucks and former U.S. Navy vessels. And that's where the merchant marine started after the war. Other items we could not absorb because they were too expensive, they were too uh, detailed, were simply dumped in the ocean. I found pictures of uh, M5 tanks wow. and uh, guns really being dumped in Manila Bay or in Subic Bay because, you know, instead of turning it over to the Philippine Army, they, they dumped it. It's pro they're probably still there at this mm -hmm. point. Wow, wow. What a waste. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you, Dr. Jose, for that very insightful um, reply. So I hope uh, a lot of uh, our questions have been answered about the rehabilitation and reparation. Uh, James, there's a question here from Ms. Margot Kamaya. Uh, I know you're doing a book on Japan now. Uh, if Europe had the Marshall Plan, did the U.S. government also have a similar plan for the Philippines? Why was the focus more on Japan rather than the Philippines? Great question. And uh, the answer to that is, 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 is really no. Uh, you know, there, there wasn't per se a plan. I mean, the plan all along from the Tidings McDuffie Act in 1934 was to, for the Philippines to gain independence in 1946. And so uh, the destruction, I, you know, I think the U.S., it's just my opinion, but I, I suspect they looked at the amount of destruction and the damage and they said, you know what, you want your independence since 1946, here you go, uh, good luck. And uh, the difference, you know, with Japan to some extent was that there was a real effort by the world leaders of the time, FDR, that, that really came out of 1943 conference in Casablanca that they had to root out this militarism that had caused Germany to rise up and had caused the empire of Japan to do the same. And, and so a lot of the effort was made on sort of how to prevent there from being another world war. Because you, you have to remember, I mean, we've had two of these world wars back to back in just a couple of decades. And so, you know, the United Nations grew out of that, you know, the effort to rebuild, um, you know, the lessons learned after World War I were that Europe was so destroyed and the reparations on top of Germ Germany held them back economically that it allowed for someone like Adolf Hitler to, to sort of rise up and, and, and harness that, um, that, that, that frustration of the people. And they really wanted to rebuild Europe and rebuild Japan to prevent that from happening again. And so that's why so much of the attention was placed on uh, Japan and rebuilding it and, uh, and trying to make sure that didn't happen again. It's important to remember too that the, the post-World War II desires very quickly morphed into the Battle of the Cold War which was communism and the rise of, you know, China was going through its civil war at that point, you know, Mao Zedong would, would emerge uh, uh, victorious there. The Soviet Union, you know, the division of, of Berlin, you know, and, and, and the American concern for the rise of communism. So Japan very quickly went from being a, you know, former defeated um, opponent to being a bulkhead to sort of block the expansion of communism. And so US, the U.S. viewed Japan as an outpost uh, in Asia and, a, and, a, and an ally to sort of push back against that. So the geopolitical situation that emerged just a few years after the end of World War II really played a role in, in sort of the handling of Japan, uh, particularly as we move into the 1950s and later 1950s. It had everything to do with what Cecilia was talking about as well with the, the release of all the Japanese war criminals. I mean, you had Japanese war criminals who were, you know, convicted and sentenced to execution, who were then their sentences were downgraded to life in prison. And then by 1958, all the prisoners still in Sugamo and elsewhere were just released in a, in a blanket amnesty uh, in order to curry favor with the Japanese public at that time. And, uh, because the U.S. needed Japan as that Cold War wall, that bulkhead. Yes, and in 1953, 
uh, President Quirino gave that pardon to all the Japanese who were imprisoned in Bilibid. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, related to the war crimes trials, uh, Ms. Cecilia Gerland, there's one question here. What was the general sentiment of the Filipino, Filipinos on the outcome of the war crimes trial? Did they feel vindicated enough considering only the top brass were tried and executed and many escaped prosecution? Ms. Cecil? Uh, you know, th this is such a uh, personal question. I'm sure a lot of Filipinos were outraged that a lot of the, uh, not just the Japanese uh, uh, soldiers, but the collaborators, uh, a lot of them escaped uh, justice, uh, as, as James said, first with the uh, amnesty uh, in 1948, uh, and then, you know, the 1953 uh, pardon of the 105 Japanese war criminals in Muntinglupa. Uh, so, so, I guess, and as I said, there are, or there were, uh, Japanese uh, uh, soldiers who should have been convicted but never were. Uh, as I said, uh, that Suji, uh, he even has a statue in his hometown. <laughs> he became a member of the Diet and uh, so he was never convicted. And according to the dossier from the CIA, um, I think, I'm not sure if the U.S. Air Force wanted him because he was good in intelligence. He worked on intelligence uh, starting with the Kwantung Army and later on in China. He was very well versed uh, with the Chinese situation. And of course, we had uh, Mao, uh, you know, after the war, communism uh, in China. So Chiang Kai-shek was uh, getting defeated. So I think he was of value. Uh, that's all I could say. So I don't know how the current population feel about this, but but in fairness, you know, Kirino did pardon uh, the 105 Japanese war criminals, but he himself uh, suffered a uh, great loss with the uh, massacre of his family, his wife and two children. Yes. Um... That was a very great move by Kirino, I guess, which restored relations between Japan and the Philippines. Ah, time is up. <laughs> uh, we've already extended 17 minutes. Uh, there's a ton of questions, but uh, we can't accommodate uh, all the questions anymore. So um, maybe one last question for our, uh, for our panelists. And uh, can you give a brief reply to this, all of you? is what are the similar similarities that we are currently experiencing with the pandemic and World War II? What are the lessons we can learn from World War II that can be applied now? Can we start with Ms. Cecil and then Dr. Isa and James? This is our last question. We must be prepared. So we saw that uh, during the uh, beginning of the war in the Philippines and, and I guess elsewhere. Uh, that the United States uh, was not prepared, uh, actually, because of uh, socio-political uh, reasons uh, before the war. You know, the U.S. Congress was anti-war, so the budget, the military was so uh, was so small. It was number 17 uh, amongst the world's armies in 1938. So we must be prepared. Always be prepared, uh, like the pandemic now. Uh, and we are suffering for the lack of preparation. Agree. Dr. Hussein, we're, on a Zoom, we're on a Zoom call because of the lack of preparation right now. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, yeah, you, you and I can both agree that we're, uh, you know, the U.S. was once again not prepared as we're pushing toward 165,000 lives lost in the United States. Oh, wow. States. Is that the current so, count now? Yeah, it's, it's wow. up above about 165 now. So, and we're dealing with whether kids will be in face learning right now and um, all sorts of challenges that we did not anticipate back then. So one thing I'll add to what Cecilia said is the dif one difference I see between the pandemic and World War II is we fortunately are not dealing with wrecked cities. And uh, we are dealing with massive economic fallout. We are dealing with... Um, lives lost and uh, an unknown future medical conditions and things like that, but we fortunately aren't having to deal with 
destruction that was seen in places like Manila, uh, mm-hmm. Europe, and, and Japan. So that's um, that's an upside, at least, to it. Thank you, James. Dr. Jose? Yeah, I think there are several lessons that we can learn. Again, the two incidents are very different. Uh, one, one did result in ruined buildings, but both of them, uh, the, the war, the end of the war and what's going on now, both are seeing economic collapse, loss of lives, extreme difficulty in day-to-day living. It's just that in the uh, 1945 case, the enemy uh, was visible. We could react physically and today it's invisible. So it's very different. But I think there are lessons to be learned insofar as, for example, mobilization of the economy. I remember when the pandemic had started, someone asked me, why, why, why doesn't the U.S., for example, go into that uh, war mobilization mode? And uh, in World War II, they mass produced all these weapons. They can do it again today. And the same thing in the Philippines. Uh, there are people who are left out of jobs. Now there are ways to uh, hire these people in, in, in terms of other forms of work that are related to curtailing the pandemic. So... I think the search for uh, a a holistic approach is something that we should look into. They were the same problems faced in 1945. Osmania had it. The problem with Osmania, Osmania wanted to to create a unified Philippines to help solve all those problems because they were very serious problems. But it was difficult to unify the Philippines because they were collaborators on one hand who were in jail the guerrilla forces were fighting each other for turf warfare. And then politics stepped in. Uh, You had some who wanted to, were aiming for the next elections in 1946. So rather than focus on the immediate needs, some politics came in. That's one lesson we should have learned. It, uh, It kind of steamed our approach in 1945. And I think we should have learned from that. Uh, We need a, a, good holistic plan which experts are needed. Now, looking at 1945-46, we did see some of them coming together, some early city planning, but again, uh, we didn't have the facilities nor the money to uh, solve all those problems in the short period of time. Very well said, Dr. Jose. We must be united if we are going to fight this pandemic, right? Oh, we're already uh, 22 minutes uh, over time. Uh, still a lot of questions coming in and people following up if their questions are going to be answered. We're so sorry we're running out of time. Uh, this is just an extension. Thank you to our speakers. But uh, before we go, let us leave you with these thoughts. The Philippines was in a very sad state at the end of the war. The war brought colossal damage and destruction to lives and property. Cities lay in ruins. The economy crippled. Not a single coconut mill was operable. Farms and sugar mills had been destroyed and inter-island shipping was non-existent. Figures running to the billions were calculated to provide a quantifiable estimation of damages to infrastructure and industries. But the psychological and moral damage done to the Filipino people remained incalculable. The end of the war was not really an end, but the beginning of an equally challenging chapter in our history. Perhaps more challenging, for we were faced with the enormous burden of rehabilitation and reconstruction. It is truly noteworthy how our nation, battered, bruised, and scarred by the war, was able to face these daunting tasks. The Filipinos have proven, time and again, that we are a resilient and faithful people. No war will ever put us down, not a calamity, nor a pandemic. So with this, we end our... uh, program, our Q&A, and uh, we'd like to thank our viewers. So this morning when they were putting in their good mornings in the chat, we have viewers all the way from Ilocos down to Zamboanga. Thank you very much for tuning in, and um, thank you very much for forwarding your questions. Thank you to our speakers, Dr. Rico Jose of the UP Department of History, James Scott, author of best-selling Rampage, uh, which brought the Battle of Manila to the world. Thank you for that, James. And of course, Ms. Cecilia Garland of Bataan Legacy Historical Society, who is a very feisty lady, I must admit. I love you, Cecil. And who um, lobbied so that the World War II in the Philippines will be included in the grade 11 
curriculum of the California, uh, of the high school in California. Kudos to you, Ati Cecil. And so um, before we end, we would like to take this chance to invite you to the National Conference on the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. May we show that slide, Andre? <laughs> So this will be on September, every Thursdays of September from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Uh, this is brought to you by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. And on September 3, it will be Dr. Jose, Dr. Deviana, and yours truly. And on, uh, we'll please tune in to their Facebook page or go to, their, uh, to the NHCP website to register. This is a free webinar for all. And uh, we have another um, webinar on September 5. Uh, for the intramuros learning sessions and um, that will be Dr. Jose and I and we'll have a special guest Jane Zobel of the MacArthur Memorial. I hope uh, you mar mark your calendars as well. Um, and with this I turn over the mic to Sophie. Sophie? Hi. Thank you again Ms. Desh, Benipayo and to our speakers. Sir James Scott, Dr. Rico Jose, and Ms. Cecilia Gerlan um, for the presentations and the wonderful Q&A session. Thank you, of course, to everyone who joined us here today and to those who, send, who sent their questions. As mentioned earlier, this activity is part of Warren Hope, our, our series of commemorative events for the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II which also includes the virtual exhibition that you can see on your skin, screens right now through the Google Art and Culture account of the Filipinas Heritage Libra Library. Please visit it by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to tinyurl.com slash fhl dash google dash war dash child. We would also like to thank our partners, the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines for supporting this event. Please do not forget to like our social media pages for updates. Follow the Filipinas Heritage Library, the Ayala Foundation, U.S. Embassy in the Philippines, and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Please visit the library's website at www.filipinaslibrary.org.ph to know more about our Filipiniana collections and to access our online library. For materials on World War II in the Philippines, please check out the Roderick Hall collection at rodhall.filipinaslibrary.org.ph. We would also like to invite you to our upcoming workshops, a rerun of our workshops on the 29th of August. First is the rerun of the Basics of Character Design Illustration Workshop with Marcos Nada at 9 a.m., to register, go to bit.ly character design 2 or scan the QR code flashed on your screens right now. We also have a rerun of our Writing from Your Memories workshop. It's a beginner's writing workshop for women with Maya Kalika Collins at 1.30 p.m. of the same day. To register, go to bit.ly woman writing 2 or scan the QR code flashed on your screens right now. Please note that slots for these workshops are limited. Registration is subject for approval based on the availability of your slots. However, both are free. We'd like to hear your feedback. Please go to bit.ly Liberation Talks Feedback or scan the QR code to share with us your thoughts about this webinar. Again, thank you everyone. We hope you learned more about history and World War II. Please stay safe and stay healthy. Until next time. Bye.